Hello, I'm Bob Denton, and welcome to another conversation. Well, poor behavior in schools is not new, but educators' testimony and data confirm that student behavior has deteriorated since the COVID pandemic. With well, joining me in a conversation on issues of student behavior and discipline is Dr. Ken Nicely, Superintendent of Roanoke County Schools, and Dr. Bernard Bregan, Superintendent of Montgomery County Schools, and thanks so much for joining the conversation. Thanks Pleasure to be here. Well, I tell you, I, I noticed uh, in preparing for our discussion, the Department of Education, Institute of Education, they reported earlier this year that there was a 56% increase in classroom student misconduct, 49% increase in misbehavior outside the classroom. An article in Adweek reported 66% of teachers and principals have said they see more misbehavior. Is that true that you see in terms of your um, uh, schools? I'd like Dr. Nicely go first. Yep. Well, I, you know, I, I think when you look at uh, uh, national stories and even ones that come out of, uh, you know, at a statewide level, uh, it's important to look at uh, local context. Um, there's so much variation in terms of what kind of learning uh, environment student experience during the pandemic. Um, and so I think that plays a, you know, a huge role into try to understand those uh, variances, but um, uh, at the end of the day, absolutely. I mean, we, you know, we definitely hear from our teachers, our principals that, um, uh, you know, the, the time away from normal sort of social interactions um, seems to have had a, you know, a, a, a negative impact on student behavior. And how about you? Yeah, I think to uh, build upon what Dr. Nicely said, we did recognize after the pandemic when students came back to school full time, and in New Jersey, as well as in Montgomery County, I moved down here about a year ago to my current position. And directly after the students returned from the pandemic, we did see an increase in maladaptive behaviors, um, inappropriate conduct in the classrooms and outside. But interestingly enough, especially in Montgomery County, last year, um, we started to see less of those inappropriate conduct oh. behaviors. And um, we had a significant increase, like I said, when we first came back in 21, 22, and then over 22, 23, school year 22-23, we saw those uh, behaviors decline. And I wanna attribute that to the supports we put in place and the additional counseling. And uh, as Dr. Nicely said, that isolation that occurred during the pandemic had devastating effects. As a, I think as a race, we are um, social animals. And anytime we're isolated for a period of time, I think it has a detrimental effect. And we'll talk a little bit about um, some of the, the tools and what have you as, as um, we go forward. But, but, but let's get a sense of the type of misbehaviors we're talking about, because what does that really mean? What are the most common, um, what you would call uh, misbehavior or discipline issues and in terms of your system? I think, um, you know, uh, uh, generally speaking, students learning to uh, navigate disagreements uh, you know, we get into a conflict, you know, how do I work through that? How can we, uh, uh, you know, resolve, resolve conflict in, in, in civil ways? Um, so you definitely see that play out, um, you know, among students. Uh, and sometimes, you know, between interactions with, um, you know, students and, uh, you know, the staff in the schools. And so I think just, um, uh, you know, learning to navigate those uh, social situations and, and, and natural conflicts that occur is, is probably one of the biggest challenges that students are facing. Yes, sir. I, I would say that's similar to what Dr. Nicely said, Bob, that it was um, inappropriate conduct in the classroom, some acts of insubordination, but the majority were in students mitigating conflicts among themselves mm. and, you know, how to appropriately um, deal with those conflicts when they arise and not resorting to um, a physical action or any type of violence. And so the extreme would be and less frequent would be things of, of the pushing or the or the physical kind of assault that we would say is uh, would be on the other uh, extreme well we talked about some of the things about pre-covid the isolation what about some other kinds of things that are percolating it seems for example this seems a lot of mental health issues that have increased it seems to be somewhat generational we have a coarseness in society in general i mean it just seems like that mentioned earlier uh, in a private discussion that kind of was a perfect storm when you get to the pandemic and coming out. And so it just seems like that the environment also contributed uh, um, to the situation. Would you agree with that? I would. I think we as a, a community and wherever that community is, whether you're Southwest Virginia or New Jersey or across the country, we're less tolerant of people that are different than ours. And it used to be a time I can remember where it didn't matter what side of the aisle you were on. There was a mutual respect 
regardless of what your position was on topics of things of, of importance. And I do think that that's modeled in our, in our government and on television and across the, uh, the span of human interaction and that interacts with our students in the classroom, that they tend to see people different or disagreeing with them as somehow being uh, bad as opposed to just, hey, we have different perspective and different views. But I do think I see the power of our teachers and having a positive impact on students in that respect. And when they connect with them and have those um, positive relationships, that they can work with the children to understand that we are all in the same you know, boat together, right? And that we do have differences, but it doesn't make us bad or good, that we should be able to work through those. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree with, uh, with Dr. Briggs. I mean, you know, there were so many factors that uh, we were already seeing prior to the, the pandemic, and I think the, you know, the, the pandemic just served to sort of exacerbate um, those variables. I mean, we were already having uh, community conversations and uh, town hall style meetings with parents just about cell phone use and uh, what I like to refer to as anti-social media, right? <laughs> um, just because, you know, a lot of, I think some, there's some science around the idea that, um, uh, you know, kids' uh, just brains have been sort of been rewired in terms of how they learn to interact, um, you know, through those platforms and it's not always a good thing. Um, but um, the, you know, the, some of the isolation Dr. Reagan mentioned that occurred during the pandemic, I think just um, sort of, uh, you know, exacerbated those, those things that were already in play. And I think that a lot of the, uh, the, the consequences of that, of that, that we've seen uh, were, were results of um, you know, many of those variables. But, you know, I have to, to echo uh, uh, the, the notion that uh, the, the role that schools can play um, in trying to help stu students uh, sort of relearn normal social interactions and appropriate uh, social interactions, uh, I think is more important than ever. And we'll get to some of those uh, tactics and techniques as well. Uh, one thing that was a little bit concerning um, in preparing for our conversation reading that a couple of places were mentioning that indeed there it's become such a, a problem and perhaps more in inner city or other kinds of areas, but to the point that some teachers are leaving the profession. And that's really alarming that uh, one of the reasons of leaving the profession is because of trying to control in the behavior um, of the students. Are you noticing or heard or experiencing that? I know teacher shortage is a reality mm -hmm. anyway. Uh, Bob, I think that's a piece of it. I, I think when we have to deal with some of the student behaviors in the classroom, it just adds to some of the frustrations our staff have. But we've also asked them to do more and more over time right. and without any really additional compensation. And where, where I grew up, you know, um, our teachers had a role to play and they were the teacher, but the parents and the homes played a, a large role too in helping mold you and putting those moral um, directions in place and trying to build your character and all that. And I think as time goes on, we have more and more things that we expect our instructional teacher staff to do. And, and you, you mentioned earlier about mental health. A lot of the issues presenting themselves are related to mental health, which unless you have a licensed clinician in the building, mm -hmm. that's really not your wheelhouse on, on what to do. Mm -hmm. And I, I know we'll talk later about it, but we put in some supports where we have clinicians in the building mm -hmm. and try to really be preventative and, and help students cope with some of the feelings they're having and the things that result in um, those maladaptive behaviors. Mm -hmm. Anything you'd like to add that is related? Yeah, I would, I would agree. I, I think, um, you know, the, 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 the challenges of managing student behavior, um, you know, certainly contribute to, um, uh, you know, job satisfaction for teachers. But I think that's one factor among, among many. Uh, so I would definitely agree with that. Fortunately, um, you know, here locally, um, I know in Montgomery County and Roanoke County both, we're sort of bucking the trend of what you see nationally and across the state in terms of teacher retention and recruitment. Um, we've, you know, the, a lot of what you're hearing about folks leaving their profession in droves is, isn't really playing out locally necessarily. So we're really pleased with that and, and think that's, um, you know, something to contribute to um, just the, the hard work that uh, uh, I think we put into school systems, but also the, the resilience and, and dedication of, our, of, the, of the staff that we have. Well, um, from a 30,000 foot view, um, okay, you're going to develop policy based upon aspects of what is misbehavior and discipline kind of issues. What are some of the guiding principles? What are some of the things uh, from a philosophical perspective that you bring to those discussions related to discipline or behavior? Yeah, I think student discipline, people misinterpret that as being reactive when something happens and occurs and you know, what are the consequences and to make sure they're consistent across the board, which is a piece of it, right? That's really critical too. 
to make sure we're aware of what expectations are okay in the classroom and what aren't. But before that starts, to develop the expectations with the students, having input, even as young as elementary, working with the teachers and the teams and develop a clear set of expectations for classroom behaviors that are appropriate and are inappropriate. And how do we deal with it and how do we mitigate it when it is inappropriate? And it's interesting. When I was a teacher and then again as a principal, when we involve students and parents in those conversations beforehand, as we're developing those policies and procedures, as you mentioned, Bob, so much more effective when and if those issues occur when students are misbehaving. And I think we miss that sometimes, and we want to have a zero tolerance, and we have a policy that reacts to whatever's occurring, and we don't take that proactive approach in the beginning, and that's where we miss it. That's where it really matters, because when students and staff, too, I, I guess in any endeavor, are, when they're a part of the decision-making process and moving forward, and clearly defining what our expectations are and helping put in policies and protocols to make sure they're adhered to, they're much more likely to comply and be a part of it and own it. Mm -hmm. I would agree with that. Um, you know, one of the things that we actually invested in uh, prior to the pandemic was um, um, a program called Positive Behavior in Interventions and Supports. And um, when we started that, um, you know, I insisted with our staff, it, it's fine to say you're going to do a new program, but you have to do it with fidelity. You have to do it as it was intended to do in order to get the, the outcomes that, that research shows you can get out of those. So, you know, um, improved behavior, improved attendance, not only with students as well as staff. Um, so those are some things that I'm grateful that we invested in prior to the pandemic, and I think that's really paid off prior to have built a foundation to, as Dr. Bregan was saying, uh, set clear expectations up front, be proactive, and then gives you some tools in order to be able to react effectively when, when students don't live up to those expectations. At the high school level, uh, one thing we love about that is this idea of student voice. Students want to have a sense of community. Like this is, you know, uh, you know this is uh, a place where we all study and learn together. And so we want some buy-in, we want a voice in terms of what that looks like. And when uh, you, you apply some positive peer, peer pressure, uh, in, the, in that direction, I mean, it really goes a long way as well. Well, I think that's very important, making that distinction, that good policy is preventive, and it doesn't always have to be reactive. But you raise an interesting point about parents, because we seem to be in that mode now where parental rights is big, certainly expressing more attitudes as it relates to education, school policies, what mm -hmm. have you. Our parents can either be helpful in the process or hindering to the process. Are you finding that relationship with parents kind of interesting, sometimes helpful, but if you call and say, little Johnny is not exactly behaving, they say, well, what are you doing wrong? How does that work? <laughs> it's a great question. I think it depends on the parent, right? <laughs> right? But, you know, our parents are our first teachers in every aspect, whether that's academic stuff, behavioral things, character, and all that. And I, I, I have found, Bob, that when we're most effective, we work in concert with our parents. And sometimes, as you said, when we recognize some of those deficits in support that we would want in order to get the behaviors we want in the classrooms, they typically come from capacity. And when we work with our parents to help them and develop techniques and how they can support what we're trying to do in the home, which may um, impact, obviously, what occurs in the classroom. We've been very successful, and I think we have to continually work towards having that positive relationship with our parents, and especially the ones that maybe at times, um, for lack of a better word, are a little more difficult when interacting with, um, typically need the, they need the most amount of support, and it often comes from uh, their capacity. And it, whatever is going on in their lives, right, we forget how complicated life is right now, and especially uh, my children are no longer young, but trying to manage your, your, your work, your house, young children and getting all that together and get everybody out the door with their lunch pail right at eight o'clock is really difficult. So I, I have found in my experience when we, we work together, um, we typically can uh, correct any issues that may occur. I agree. We, we were fortunate to have uh, so many parents who are very supportive, who really, um, you know, uh, first of all, they, they, they care about their own students and they appreciate uh, what, uh, what teachers do for them. Um, you know, in the classroom. We do um, have those incidents, like you, like you suggested, in which you, um, you know, occasionally call up a parent and, okay, what did you do wrong? What did you do to provoke? But, you know, uh, you also realize that some, some of the behaviors you see at school, um, you, you know, are also happening in the home. <laughs> yeah. And the tipping point in that relationship is when some trust develops and we can kind of uh, admit to each other, okay, let's, uh, these are happening in both places, so what can we do to work together 
to, to better support um, uh, the students and uh, you know, not, not only in the home as well as the, the school. I think um, when, they're, when they're both on the same page, working in concert, working in partnership, um, we definitely have better outcomes you know, for the students. Well, you know, and in terms of the teachers, I'm assuming now that there's kind of mandatory and kind of training requirements, expectations that teachers have to take and uh, consciously be aware of tactics of de-escalation or things like that. So I'm assuming there's dedicated teacher training in terms of managing misbehavior. 100%. And we, did, we train in exactly what you said, how to de-escalate situations, Bob. Because whenever something's occurring that's inappropriate, it can go one of two ways. It can either be de-escalated or escalated. And sometimes unknowingly, especially maybe with children with special needs, we inadvertently escalate it, right? So there's specific training that we do use crisis prevention intervention that is very effective at de-escalating de situations and teaching people how to do that verbally as, you know, not resorting to restraint or anything like that. Yeah, part of that is, um, uh, you know, definitely, um, you know, doing the training with the teachers. But um, Dr. Reagan mentioned earlier, you know, we were fortunate to have good uh, school counselors uh, sure. available to us and including uh, clinicians uh, uh, in the schools. And so we really rely on them and appreciate um, what, what they, the insights they bring to bear and be able to provide the training for those teachers. You know, one of the difficult things in y'all's position is so much additional support might be needed in terms of counseling, additional people in the classroom, um, professionals in terms of the mental health and what have you. Well, that's money that's not going to the core mission. I mean, there seems like there needs to be so much more support, and we find that in terms of higher education too. Tuition goes up, yeah, but we've got to have so many more counselors, what have you, so I mean, it, it, it's, it means more money. What is your thoughts and relates to the role of technology, such as uh, metal detectors and maybe cameras and more lights, and we're not maybe in that kind of uh, geographic areas where that's uh, essential per se, but the role of technology, is that really helpful in some of the behavioral and discipline things? Well, that's a great question and it's all encompassing. I don't know if I can answer it specifically, but I, I think some of those things you mentioned, like metal detectors and other things, cameras play a role in helping us to uh, keep in, ensure a safe and secure environment. But what happens sometimes with those devices and technologies is we forget that the key ingredient is the human interaction and the relationships with students. Inevitably, whenever we've had some significant incidents of um, maladaptive behaviors, there were precursors and there were things that we could have done to intervene ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And when you have those positive relationships with staff, um, you're able to do that and identify potential concerns through behavioral threat assessments and everything else. But they don't occur with technology, they occur with people. And the same thing with metal detectors, they're great, right? You walk through the airport and anywhere else you go where you have to go through them, but they're only as good as the people manning them. And you know, one of the things that we found that they, that would require a significant amount of additional staff. And again, it, you know, if you look at some of the incidents that happened nationwide and, and knock on wood, not locally, um, they had those things in place and they still happen, right? Where their teacher inadvertently props open a door in a parking lot that people can circumvent those devices. So I think the real focus, Bob, on those preventative, preventative ideas is working really closely with the people because they are the key. I think there, there are definitely a lot of uh, you know uh, tools that we have that we can use these days. Uh, you know, we, we don't um, rely so much on um, the metal detector. We're not there yet. Um, um, I think in a lot of ways it's uh, you know, where do you want to invest uh, your time and resources? And I think sometimes you could put things like that in place and almost have a false sense of security because um, if you're not doing the hard work of actually knowing your students and, and, and be able to have those check-ins and, and check-outs and knowing if, if, if the student's having a good day or a bad day, if you're missing those pieces, then, uh, you know, no, no metal detector or anything else is really going to, uh, you know, prevent you know, acts of violence that we're seeing. There's some great technologies out there that we're definitely employing um, and, uh, uh, you know, monitoring student behavior online, you know, monitoring what they're doing in their laptops. Mm -hmm. We get alerts every day if we, if we, have, if we see some, uh, uh, some red flags, some keywords kind of pop up that we can, can follow up with the students mm -hmm. to find out what's going on. Um, we, we definitely have some technologies that really help us um, more so than ever to really have, a, have our fingers on, you know, what, what, what students are looking at online and, uh, and be able to follow up appropriately to make sure that they're, they're okay and, uh, you know, hopefully uh, prevent 
um, you know, any sort of uh, threats of violence or, or um, you know, any other sort of uh, behaviors that's going to interfere with their learning. Well, you know, I'm, 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 I'm old and getting older. Uh, and the thoughts that you would have to have a police officer or a resource officer in elementary schools and in high schools. And then it became a little bit controversial. Um, what is your take in terms of the value and role of resource officers in the schools? Here, here's what I know about SROs. Um, and, 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 and as Dr. Reagan said, there have been plenty of uh, issues, you know, incidents of school violence in which uh, our officer might have, have been there but uh, proved ineffective. It all comes down to the, the person that you have. Um, so that, that human element you can never, uh, you know, discount. Um, what, what, I, what I do know is there's no one answer, but what I do know is if we have an officer, you know, on campus, if there is uh, ever an incident, uh, I'd rather have that person on site and be able to respond uh, much more quickly than, than not. And so, uh, we, we definitely embrace our school resource officers, appreciate them, and our goal is to have uh, one on each of our campuses. Mm. You feel the same way? Yeah, I would support that. I, you know, it's funny, the uh, school resource officers and the, the trainings that we do, I think it's really valuable, and it provides an opportunity for a police presence in a positive way to be in our schools, when sometimes, as in recent years, it was viewed ne very negatively. But I think, as Dr. Nicely said, one of the pieces that people don't understand is you can't measure how many things were prevented because the police officer was there. Mm -hmm. And just having the, the police car in front of the building and an officer either walking around the building maintaining a uh, presence in the front of the building as a deterrent, you don't know how many issues you may have deterred. And what I have found in my experience with people that are looking to perpetrate inappropriate things in buildings and schools is they look for the soft target. And when they see a police vehicle and a police presence in front of the building, they may say, hey, you know what? Not this one, let me try to find something else. And for that, in and of itself, it's worth its value. Well, I'm probably dating myself again, but such concepts as detention, suspension, expulsion, are those tools that are used today or are they modified in some way as a more last resort kind of uh, dealing with behavioral issues? I'll start by saying, uh, you know, a lot of people um, want to think in terms of uh, zero tolerance when it comes mm -hmm. to different uh, types of uh, you know, disciplinary incidents. When we, when we talk about zero tolerance, we mean we don't sweep anything under the rug. We deal with anything that comes our way, whether it's a bullying situation, whether it's a threat situation, we take those seriously and we follow up on every single one. In terms of what the disposition is and you know, the outcome, whether it's a, you know, should be a, a suspension, some kind of uh, in school, uh, you know, maybe counseling is appropriate. Um, but um, um, unfortunately, there are those situations in, in which um, if, uh, you know, if there's a, special, especially a certain level of violence, uh, you know, we don't hesitate to say, look, you know, w w you, you need to be uh, maybe temporarily in one of our alternative programs. Um, we have had situations where students, uh, you know, uh, come up for expulsion. Um, and so we do believe that uh, it's very important to set those clear boundaries as well, um, that we're not, that we're going to protect the safety of, of all students, uh, but we still at the end of the day treat every student individually and uh, address those um, behaviors on a, on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. I would agree with Dr. Nicely that it is a uh, last resort, right? And uh, I've been doing this for a number of years and I've yet to find the student that didn't want to learn. Mm -hmm. So when you resort to those things, whether it's a suspension or it's an out of school expulsion, you're removing that child from the opportunity to learn. And I do think that sometimes helps them change their behavior, whether they then transition back to a um, alternative school before coming back into the general setting. And I also think it sends a message to other children, which is important that type of behavior, whatever that egregious act was, is not, it's not tolerated here. And it helps maintain and create a safe environment for everybody there. You know, we only have a, a, virtually a couple of minutes remaining. Uh, before I give you the final word, I would encourage parents to go to the Virginia Department of Education website and look at the behavior codes for 22-23. Look at the behavior codes and it lays out some of the things that are Accept, well, not acceptable, but a range of the behaviors that are problematic. And I think that's very informative. Again, we only have a minute and a half or so. Final thoughts that you would want to share related to the broader topic of misbehavior and discipline. I think it relates to relationships with teachers, with counselors, with coaches and all that. You know, my, my, my dad passed when I was a youngster. 
and I had other people that played that supportive role in my life and they were teachers and coaches and I think today as we move more towards that and develop those positive relationships with our children we can help mitigate any negative behaviors in school. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I would just add, you know, as educators, we try to be passionate about what we teach, but also about whom we teach. That, that's what comes first is, um, first of all, you know, caring about each and every student, uh, wanting to see them succeed and have that sense of belonging in our schools. Um, so we're going to do everything we can to support them and, um, and uh, you know, address any issues that come up. But we, it, it starts with caring about the individual. Well, believe it or not, that is all the time we have. I want to thank my guest, Dr. Ken Nicely and Dr. Uh, Bernard Bregan. And as always, I want to thank you for joining us. And I hope you do so again for the next conversation with Bob Denton.